So the very first thing I want to do is I want to send out a huge welcome to all of my honors biology students. Um, I'm really excited about this year. I think it's going to be a great year. Um, before we get started with the um, lesson, I want to make sure that I kind of explain to you what we're going to be doing for the rest of the year. Now, obviously, being a science class, there's going to be lots of labs, lots of activities. And what I have found in the past is a lot of times these labs and activities tend to um, kind of run short of time. And so one of the things that I've done for the past three or four years is I've actually video or actually created videos um, of each of my different lectures that we have to um, make our way through during the class. And I've had students watch these lectures outside of class. Now the first one we're going to be looking at today is going to be something that you guys are all very familiar with. And if you notice on the right hand side it says lesson overview. Sometimes it'll have somewhat of a fancy title, maybe a picture to kind of get us thinking about the material. But in this case we're going to start with chapter one in your textbook. And for most of you, again, this stuff is very familiar. What is science? And so a large part of what we're going to talk about today is going to deal with scientific method. Now one thing you guys might also notice is you notice the cursor kind of moving around on the screen. I actually have a tablet that I use as I go through my lectures and occasionally if there's something I need to emphasize um, in the lecture, for example, let's see if I can get this to come up, um, I can write on the screen so I can sort of emphasize anything that I feel is really important for you to make sure that you memorize. You know, and another side benefit of these lectures is that they're going to be on YouTube and you can always go back and watch the lecture again, especially when it comes down to preparation for any types of quizzes um, or um, tests that you might take in my class. And so students have found in the past that this is a really, really neat tool to be able to make sure that they're well prepared um, for their assessments. So to get us started, as I had said before, we're going to be talking about the scientific method, you know, the methodology of, of the scientific process. Um, definitely this is considered the heart of science. In other words, if you are in any type of science, your main goal or your main objective is to make lots and lots of observations and to ask, of course, lots and lots of questions. Now, scientific investigations begin with observations, and if you want to define observations, this is the act of noticing and describing events or processes in a very careful, and in this case, if you're in science, a very orderly way. Now, if you notice down here, we have um, two pictures, one and two, location A, location B. And what I would ask you to do if we were in a um, typical situation in class where you, I was actually lecturing to you in front of class, I would ask students to kind of describe to me what are the observations that they notice about location A and what did they notice about location B. And the first thing that would probably come to most students' minds is they would look at this um, set of two pictures and they would say, of course, location B has grass that is very tall, location A has grass that is very short. So that would be an observation. So then the next thing we might think about is once we've made those observations, it might allow us to sort of pose a question. So if you notice down here at the bottom, it says, why do marsh grasses grow to different heights in different places? So that's going to give us the opportunity to sort of question why is there a difference between these two pictures? So then of course what we do is after we've made some really good high quality observations we need to um, basically use these observations to make one of two things. We might decide to make some inferences or maybe some interpretations based on what we already know about the situation as to why there is a difference between you know the short grass in location A and the taller grass in location B and these inferences can also lead basically to um, a more maybe well thought out or organized scientific explanation um, for those observations. And in this case, we're going to call that a hypothesis. Now, it's only considered a hypothesis if it can be tested. And it can be tested in ways that are either going to support it or reject it. Now, in my class, what I would like you to do is I would like you to use the if-then-because statement. So basically, if I do this, then this will occur because of this type of format. So down here towards the bottom it says if nitrogen, which is a chemical you would find in the environment, is increased in the environment, then the growth of the marsh grass is also increased because nitrogen is a necessary part of all proteins, enzymes, and metabolic processes. Students rarely have any problems with the if or the then part but sometimes they're kind of tripped up a bit with that because. The because part is going to come from any research you might do 
about the topic that you made observations about. And so sometimes that will be used to kind of fill in the blank for this part of your hypothesis. Now once we have created a very well thought out hypothesis, our next job is to um, create what we would consider a controlled experiment. So testing a scientific hypothesis often involves designing an experiment, again, we've done this many times in the past, maybe in other science classes, that's going to keep track of various factors that could possibly change in that experiment. And what we do is we call those factors variables. Down here towards the uh, middle part of the screen, um, we have another situation where we have flask number one and flask number two, and they have a protozoan, or a very, very tiny one-cell creature in each of the different flasks. In this first one, it has the paramecium, which is the creature, plus the food that this creature would eat. In the second flask, we have the paramecium, again, that first creature we had here in flask one, plus we have the paramecium food. But what we've done, if we changed it up just a little bit, and we've added didinium, which is a second type of protozoan or one-cell creature. Down here it says, whenever possible, a hypothesis should be tested by an experiment in which only one variable is changed. And so if you compare these two groups, the one thing that has changed between the two groups is the addition of the didinium in flask number two. All other variables should be kept unchanged or controlled because we want to make sure those two groups are exactly the same. And when we do that, this type of experiment is called a controlled experiment. So then what we need to do is we need to think about why is it so important to control variables. Well, researchers can't easily tell which variable is going to be responsible for any of the results that they observe in their experiment if you change more than one variable. Now, you have two different types of variables that we look at. We have one called the independent or manipulated variable, and that's kind of the way I like to describe it as a manipulated variable because it's one you're actually going to change between the two groups. And then the second is called a dependent variable. And what I like to do is I like to actually call that a responding variable. Um, a lot of you will have been taught the independent versus dependent variable, and if you know those two terms, that's great, but I find it much, much easier for some students to see the difference between manipulate or to change and the responding. In other words, what actually happened as a result of that change. So again, looking at our two situations, paramecium plus the paramecium food, paramecium plus their food plus the didinium, what we're probably going to do here is we're going to look at the change in the population of those paramecium based on the conditions that we have in each flask. Now typically in any experiment that we're going to do, we're probably going to end up with two groups. And again, like we see down here in this diagram, what we're going to do is we're going to give those groups special names. We're going to call one the control group and one the experimental group. Now the control group is going to be exposed to exactly the same conditions as your experimental group, basically saying they're both going to be set up exactly the same. But we want to change one thing about one group. We're going to change it in the experimental group. And that is going to be our manipulated variable, our independent variable. Now scientists might set up several sets of control and experimental group to try to reproduce or replicate many of their observations that they might see. So in this case down here, this would be considered our control group, and this would be considered our experimental group simply because the didinium is what's different between these two groups. That is the change that we made. So the next thing that we have to do is after we have actually set up and conducted our controlled experiment, what we need to do is we need to now gather data. And there's going to be two different types of data that we're going to look at. One of them is going to be quantitative, which is going to deal with numbers. And the other is going to be qualitative, which, of course, does not deal with numbers. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about the different types of quantitative and qualitative data that you might have gathered if you had conducted the experiment below. Now, the first thing we might do is we might, of course, we need to know exactly what type of data are we collecting. And in this case, we would probably be looking at um, the amount of paramecium that you would find in each of the um, flasks. Now, something you might need to do is you might need to count the number of paramecium's. And so for quantitative data, we would say count paramecium. And again, please um, bear with me because my writing is not the best when you use these tablets. Um, for qualitative data, if we're looking at the two flasks, maybe we would look at maybe the color of the water in each of the different flasks. And so there's two different types of data, as I said. Quantitative is always going to deal with numbers. So maybe in this flask, we have, I don't know, 
2.5 million paramecium, while in this flask maybe we have two. And so definitely there's a difference between the two. Maybe the color of the water in this flask is, um, I don't know, maybe a murky yellow, and the color in this water is basically maybe it doesn't have any color. In other words, there's no paramecium left because the population has been depleted. So your job in any type of experiment is to make sure that you can actually recognize both types of um, data. Now, once you've actually gathered this data, the next thing you need to do is you need to be able to represent it. And so what um, a lot of scientists will do is they will use various different types of research tools to represent the data. So what they're going to do is they're going to choose the most appropriate tool for um, collecting and, of course, analyzing that data. Tools included could be things such as meter sticks. It could be things as very sophisticated machines. Um, but it also could be things simply like charts and graphs. And these are going to help scientists organize that data to make it a little easier to understand. So if, again, you think back to the height of the grasses in um, um, location A and location B, what we need to think about here is we need to think about when we did our control experiment, we were looking at the amount of nitrogen, that chemical in the environment, and what type of effect does it have on the growth of those grasses. Well, obviously, if you add nitrogen to the environment, it's going to have a very positive impact. It's going to have that grass growing really tall, and you can see that in this graph. But if you look at the control, which does not have maybe as much nitrogen or it lacks nitrogen, then the amount of growth that you would see in that grass is going to be um, relatively small. So this makes it really easy for us to see the comparison between both of our groups. Now, after we have um, gathered our data, we've represented that data in a graph, the next thing that we need to do is we need to um, basically use the data itself to either support or refute um, our hypothesis that we had posed at the very beginning um, of our, actually before we had begun our experiment. And we want to make sure that we draw a valid conclusion. Now, if you notice over here on the right, this is just kind of, um, kind of like a road map as you go through the scientific method. You have your initial observation, then maybe you create a very well thought out hypothesis. Again, use the if-then because format. Then you're going to conduct your controlled experiment. You're going to basically collect um, some data from that experiment. And then what you're going to do is you're going to interpret that data and decide whether or not your hypothesis was supported or not supported. And then that becomes essentially your final answer at the very end of your experiment. Now obviously I'm going to have you do a few more things with your conclusion um, that you see right here, but the big thing here is you need to be able to tie everything together. And what that's going to do is once you get that data, it might actually cause you to pose a brand new hypothesis which would allow you to create a brand new experiment and then of course maybe discover something brand new about the situation. Now in any type of experiment we need to make sure that we think about any sources of error that might have occurred um, during that experiment. Now we do our best to avoid errors in data collection um, but sometimes you know mistakes or errors do happen. Now data analysis and sample size again must be chosen carefully so the way that you actually collect the data and look at it and how big your sample is can be really big indicators of if there was any type of error. The larger the sample size of course the more reliable um, your data is going to be in terms of analyzing it and getting some sort of um, very valid conclusion from that data. Now once something has been tested many, many, many times, we start to sort of assume that that's probably the reason why um, the observations are what they are. It says the scientific theory is a bit different from the hypothesis that we discussed, and the question is, how is it different? Well, a theory has been tested many, many times, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of times by different scientists. A hypothesis is just our educated guess at that moment. A useful theory that has been thoroughly tested and supported by many lines of evidence may become the dominant view. In other words, that's what we see the answer as being. But no theory is ever considered the absolute truth, which unfortunately a lot of people believe that a theory is fact, and that's not necessarily the case. Science is always changing as new evidence is uncovered. A theory may be revised or replaced by a more useful explanation. Now the very last thing that we're going to look at for this particular screencast is the idea of bias. Now unfortunately sometimes um, people are intentionally biased but sometimes we're biased without even realizing it. So the way that science is applied in society can be affected by bias. And so this is essentially a particular preference or point of view that is either personal, 
rather than scientific. It says I'm looking for copies of the New York Times and it says that would be in the fiction section. So the things that are reported in the New York Times we're hoping have been validated, have been looked at, there's evidence to support what you read, but this person definitely does not um, believe um, what she would read in the New York Times is legit and so she considers it fiction. That is her bias. Now science aims to be objective but some scientists are human too. Sometimes scientific data can be misinterpreted or misapplied by scientists who want to prove a particular point. All right, so that's going to finish up um, the screencast for chapter one. And as I said, this is going to be our only screencast for chapter one. This one might be a little bit longer than most. Typically, I like the screencast to be around 10 minutes or so, maybe 12 minutes. Um, so in the future, they will be a bit shorter. But it's really important that you make sure that you get your screencast notes done before you come to class.